Hello students of India. This is astronaut Leroy Chow greeting you from Colorado Springs at the Space Foundation. I'm very pleased tonight to bring you this, uh, this message and give you a presentation about space. During my 15-year NASA career, I had the good fortune to fly four times into space, three times aboard space shuttles, and in my third, fourth mission, I got to fly aboard Russian Soyuz and fly to the International Space Station, where I served as the commander and NASA science officer of a six-and-a-half-month flight during Expedition 10. What I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into space flight, uh, share some of my adventures with you, and then to give you an idea of where we're going in the future. So I grew up during the very beginning of the space race, during the Cold War, and I followed those early missions with a lot of interest. The early astronauts, guys like Alan Shepard, the very first American to fly to space, those guys were my heroes. But it really was the Apollo moon landing that captured my imagination. I was an eight-year-old kid when we landed on the moon, and I can remember like it was yesterday, watching the black and white TV set with the rabbit ears, uh, and the scene unfold in the Mission Control Center, listening to the, the uh, transmissions coming back from the moon as the lunar module approached the surface and then actually touched down. And I remember thinking, even back then, uh, that the world had just changed and I wanted to be like those guys who were uh, so far away up there on the moon. Hours later, watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take the very first steps on the moon uh, pretty much sealed the deal for me, and I knew that I wanted to try to become an astronaut. So even as a second grader, I knew I had to make a plan. I knew I had to do well in school, uh, just to even be qualified so I could go to university and, and uh, earn a science or an engineering degree. I had to stay healthy and make the right choices, and uh, so I set about doing all of those things. Many years later, after I had earned my three degrees in chemical engineering and I had been working for a while, first in a commercial industry and then for the, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I put my application into NASA and was fortunate enough to be asked to come to Houston to interview and then eventually to get selected. So that was a very exciting time back in 1990 to get the phone call asking me to, to come to NASA to join that next group of astronauts. Uh, I packed up my car and uh, moved from California down to Houston where I've now lived for 25 years. My group came from a very diverse background. We were research engineers like myself, military test pilots from the different services, uh, a couple of flight surgeons, and uh, also a couple of physicists. We all came together in Houston and started working together, uh, learning about the shuttle systems and starting to get ready to be assigned to missions. Four years later, I got a chance to fly for my very first time aboard Space Shuttle Columbia, and that was the fulfillment of that boyhood dream so many years ago. Uh, 25 years, actually, we were flying on the 25th anniversary of the uh, Apollo 11 mission, so that was a nice coincidence. Our mission was the second international microgravity laboratory, and what that means is in the back of the space shuttle payload bay, we didn't have a satellite or anything like that. We had a laboratory module, and in it we conducted scientific research. So this was the way that we would do research before we had an international space station, and after our two-week mission was over, we had conducted over 80 different scientific investigations. Pretty quickly, I got turned around on my second flight, which was aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. And uh, the biggest deal for me on this mission, it was the first chance I had to put on the big white spacesuit and go out and conduct my first two spacewalks. What we were doing, we were testing tools and construction techniques that we would later use to build the International Space Station. My third mission, I flew aboard Space Shuttle Discovery, and we were the second major assembly mission of the space station program, and we brought two pieces of the space station with us in the back of the shuttle. We used the robotic arm to position them, and then over four spacewalks and two teams, we uh, installed those pieces, bolted them down, mated the electrical connectors, and brought them to life. We also installed the main data link between the station and the ground, the big antenna dish. That's where you get all the video coming down from the station, uh, data from the experiments, and also some of the uh, telemetry from the vehicle itself. After the landing of Space Shuttle Discovery, somehow 10 years had gone by. I'd flown three Space Shuttle missions, and I was trying to figure out what was going to be next when the chief asked me to join the Expedition Corps. Uh, this was going to be a little bit of a change for me. I'd been focusing my career on flying short-duration shuttle missions and helping the teams figure out how we were going to build that big space station, and now I was being asked to train to live and work aboard the station on what turned out to be a six-and-a-half-month flight. So that's not a decision you take lightly. It took me a couple of days to think about it to decide that I did want to make that commitment to live aboard the space station. Uh, but the, the training was actually even a bigger commitment. It would be at least three and a half years of training. I had to learn uh, to speak Russian because Russia is the other major partner. I had to spend half of my time in uh, Star City outside of Moscow, traveling back and forth every month, one month there, one month back. Uh, the Russians had to do the same thing. They had to learn English and spend half of their time in Houston. But at the end of the day, we all decided uh, that it was 
it really was worth it, and it was the most enriching flight of our career. Flying aboard a Russian Soyuz was a real treat after having been on three space shuttles. It's pretty cramped inside, but uh, it's a reliable little spacecraft that does its job extremely well. Here we are launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, uh, just east of the Aral Sea. It takes about nine minutes to get from the launch pad up into low Earth orbit. This is uh, my crewmate, Salajan Sharipov. This is our official crew portrait, Expedition 10. Salajan uh, was, a full air, uh, was an Air Force colonel uh, in the Russian Air Force. In fact, at the time, he was the youngest full colonel in the Russian Air Force. Uh, but ethnically, he's an Uzbek who was born and raised in Kyrgyzia, which is in Central Asia. So just a piece of trivia, he and I comprised the first all-Asian heritage crew in space. So the main purpose of the station, of course, is scientific research. So we did as much of that as we could. But the main purpose of our series of missions, flying only about a year and a half after the shuttle Columbia accident, was to keep the space station in a state of good repair until we can get the shuttle flying again and finish major construction. I did get to do two Russian spacewalks, which was really cool because I'd become an expert or a specialist in doing EVA assembly in American suits using American tools, and this was a chance to try out the, the Russian system. Spaceflight really is a magical experience. Uh, the best part about being in low Earth orbit is looking back at the Earth and taking photographs. Uh, on this mission alone, I shot over 16,000 photos of the Earth, so I'd just like to share a few with you quickly. This is a scene looking over the Himalaya Mountains into China, and uh, from our perch of about 280 miles up, uh, the Himalayas look pretty small, but down in there somewhere is Mount Everest. This is downtown Houston. This shows you what's possible on a clear day with a little bit of practice. Uh, you can see clearly see the buildings and the skyscrapers. Uh, you're traveling at about 17,500 miles an hour in space, so you've got to learn how to track the target as you release the shutter. But with a little bit of practice, you can get pretty, pretty sharp shots. Here's some places from around the world. This is Beijing, the capital of China. The uh, square in the middle, that's the, the uh, rectangle, that is. That's the forbidden city where the old emperors used to live. This is New Orleans. This is taken in 2004, so this is before the hurricane. This is New York City, Manhattan. Uh, you can see Central Park clearly, the uh, skyscrapers. You can see boats in the east in the Hudson Rivers. This is the southern tip of Florida, a very beautiful part of the world. Blues and greens are just spectacular. These are glaciers in South America and Patagonia. These are the Great Pyramids. You can see the two big ones, and the third smaller one is just below. Sometimes Mother Nature's just funny. I grabbed a camera in January, saw this, and uh, had the perfect thing to send to my wife for Valentine's Day. Well, six and a half months were about up. It was time to start thinking about coming home. We put our pressure suits back on, got back into our Soyuz spacecraft, and prepared to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and come back down. For entry, here I am on the right side, as you can see, it's pretty small inside that cabin, made even more so by all the bags of things that the Mission Control Center asked us to bring down with us. We landed with a big thump on the steps of Kazakhstan, even under the parachute canopy, you're still coming down at about 25 feet per second, so we have a series of uh, soft landing mechanisms that do a pretty good job of, uh, of cushioning the blow, so you hit pretty hard, but when everything works, it doesn't hurt too much. We tipped over, as sometimes happened, making it even less comfortable, but the uh, rescue forces were right on top of us. They got us out, uh, set us up in lawn chairs, handed us satellite phones so we could call our, our families and let them know that we were safe. After a quick ceremony in Kazakhstan, they put us back on the airplanes and uh, flew us back out to Star City outside of Moscow. We were reunited with our families and our loved ones. And that was the end of our, my, big, uh, my big finale of Expedition 10. Uh, I really had a great flying career, and uh, this is the picture I want to leave you with. This is a picture, of course, is of the moon, and uh, that's what inspired me to want to be an astronaut all those years ago. And on the left side is Mother Earth, home planet to all of us. The blue in the middle is uh, what was most striking to me the very first time I flew into space. Uh, it really surprised me how bright it was. It's much brighter than even in this photograph. And uh, so this picture to me says dreams. And that's what it's really all about, especially for the young folks out there today, but really for everyone. It's never too early or too late to think about what you want to do with the rest of your life. And uh, the most important thing is not to, never to stop dreaming. And once you do figure out what you want to do, to make a plan and uh, have the courage to pursue it. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and wish you all the very best of luck. Okay, so now I'll answer some of the questions that you all were kind enough to send in. Let's just dive right in. 
Okay, number one, how large is the universe? Well, the universe is, for all practical purposes, infinite. It's expanding. It started, of course, with the Big Bang and has uh, been going ever since. So uh, I can't really give you a number or, a, or a, uh, uh, anything like that, but let's just say it's really, really big. Can atmosphere be created on Mars? Well, theoretically, almost anything's possible. In fact, Mars used to have an atmosphere. It used to have a much thicker atmosphere. It had a, uh, a more liquid core at the time, and so it had a magnetosphere. And that magnetosphere helped protect the atmosphere from the uh, radiation coming from the sun. Once the core slowly started to cool and it started losing its magnetosphere, the radiation actually stripped away most of the atmosphere, and that's why the atmosphere that's left on Mars today is actually very thin. So could you restore that? In theory, you might be able to, but uh, you'd have to do something about that radiation. Otherwise, it's not going to last again. Can height of the launch satellite be changed if it has enough fuel? Yes, it can. You can make the orbit higher or lower by firing your engines. But what you can't do is change what we call the inclination. It takes an enormous amount of energy to change the actual orbital plane that the satellite is in. Okay, next series of questions. Why are comets only visible during certain times? Well, it's the same reason that stars are only visible during certain times. That is, during the nighttime, when the sun is uh, hidden away uh, on the other side of the Earth. Then the light of the stars can come through, and then the comets, like the stars, uh, when, when there is a comet passing by that we can see, uh, then you'll be able to see the light from the comet as well as the sun reflects off of the comet, and that's uh, uh, into your eyes um, in the night sky. How can I become an astronaut? What studies are required? Well, there are two things you have to do no matter what you want to become. Number one is you need to do well in school, take it seriously, study hard, do the best you can. The second is to stay healthy. Make the right choices, uh, eat right, so get enough rest, exercise, and make the, you know, just uh, do everything you can to stay healthy, and that will enable you, those two things will enable you to apply to be an astronaut once you complete your studies, get your engineering degree or a science degree or a medical degree. Uh, that will qualify you to apply to be an astronaut. Can we hear sound in space? If not, how do you communicate when you are in space? Well, strictly speaking, in space, sound waves won't propagate because sound waves need what's called a medium in order to propagate. That's either air or water or some other uh, liquid. And so on the Earth, of course, sound travels through water. It travels through the air, which is why we can talk to each other. But in space, there is no medium for the sound to travel through. We communicate in space because we are inside of a pressure vessel. We're inside of a spacecraft or a space suit. And so there is air. There is pressure and sound waves can travel. We can talk to each other in other spacecraft and other in spacesuits because we use radios. So the radio waves can travel through space and we can talk to each other just like you do with uh, your telephone or your, or your walkie-talkie. Students of a uh, force... No, okay, that's where you guys are from. <laughs> okay, next set of questions. How do you feel and relate to the vastness of space when you are making a spacewalk, and how does it feel? Well, when you're out there on a spacewalk, you feel pretty darn tiny. You know, when you look out the window of a spacecraft and you see the Earth and you see the, the universe beyond, uh, you feel pretty small. But when you're out there by yourself in a little spacesuit and you're, you're looking through your visor, uh, it makes you feel even smaller. So it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a very surreal experience. Do the spacecraft face the risk of being hit by space debris? Yes, we are concerned about that. For that reason, all spacecraft, um, including the uh, space shuttle back when it was flying, the International Space Station, and the Soyuz all have some shielding to shield us from impacts of micrometeoroids or, or other uh, particles out there. Uh, of course, if it's big enough, then it's not, you know, the shield's not necessarily going to stop it. So we do everything we can uh, to mitigate that risk, but it is still there. How do you adjust to sleeping in space? Well, sleeping in space is actually quite comfortable. The biggest thing is uh, getting used to what to what to do with your neck because, uh, you know, on the Earth, you're used to putting your head on a pillow. In space, of course, that doesn't work, and so you're not quite sure what to do with your neck and your head. But once you get used to that, floating and sleeping is actually quite comfortable. Okay, next set. What are your views about the Curiosity and the New Horizons missions? I think they're very exciting. The images coming back from Mars have been great. And just very recently, we saw the uh, highest definition images of Pluto as the New Horizons spacecraft went by at an altitude of 7,800 7, miles. And so we learned a lot. We are learning a lot. The other instruments on board also let us know a little bit about the chemical composition of the surface. We were able to observe uh, tall mountain features and evidence of, uh, of uh, volcanic activity 
activity, and we also detected water ice as well as methane. So that's pretty darn exciting. Do you think life exists beyond Earth? I have no doubt there is a lot of life out there in the universe. It's my personal opinion, uh, it just makes sense to me. But I don't think we've found each other because uh, uh, the distances are so vast. We're talking about hundreds or even uh, hundreds of thousands or, or even more light years. And in one light year is a distance that light travels in one year. And so the distances are so vast, uh, we have not, I don't believe we've found each other. Can we create an Earth-like habitat in space? Again, anything is possible. We can create a habitat that is, uh, take the space station for example. That's kind of an Earth-like environment without the gravity. We were able to keep pressure in there, we were able to keep the temperature correct, uh, we are able to keep humans alive and healthy in that environment. It's not exactly like being on Earth, but, uh, but it can support life. Okay, what else do we have? Sir, your pen name is Sandong. What is the significance of it? Well, Sandong province in China is where both of my parents were originally born, where they, they came from. And so because I'm of Chinese-American heritage, uh, I took the call sign Sandong during my, unofficially during my, my space station mission. After separation from the spacecraft, what happens to the rockets that are propelled into space? Well, the boosters, the, once they're spent, they are ejected, they're jettisoned from the rest of the stack, and they fall back to Earth. That's because we don't need to carry that weight with us, and so generally speaking, they fall into the ocean. In the case of the space shuttle, the solid rocket boosters were parachuted into the ocean and were recovered, refurbished, and reused. But most other boosters are simply just lost in the ocean. Why do astronauts grow taller in space? We actually, you know, your spine in the absence of gravity actually relaxes and stretches out, and so you get about one to one and a half inches taller. Uh, but before you get too excited about being taller, once you're back on the Earth within about an hour or so, you're pretty much back to your normal height. Okay, well, we'd like to take a, a moment to thank all the schools out here listed, all the partner schools, and uh, especially, especially Vidya Valley School for uh, making this all possible. Uh, it's been a real pleasure visiting with you guys, and I uh, wanted to wish you all the very best of luck. Thank you.